check, mic check. All right, we're good. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so we are, those of you that are new, uh, we have been in a series on the seven churches of the book of Revelation. If you need past notes, just talk to me. I'll make sure you get hooked up with those. Um, and I've been basing this class out of my Bible and out of this book. This is one of the books by Rick Renner. And this book uh, was given to me actually by Judge and Judy. And he wrote such a great uh, series of writings on these churches that whenever they was building a museum over in this area, they sought him out and they used all of his material. And so his material is viewed as some of the best that is out there. And it's kind of funny because uh, I was watching another video on one of the churches. And as I'm watching it, I'm looking at the, thank you, dear. I'm looking at the pictures in this video and they're out of this book. And so I was like, they're using Rick Renner's stuff too. They're just not giving him credit for it. <laughs> but so this is half of the churches. And this is the other half of the churches. This book's eight, over 800 pages. And so if that tells you any idea of how much time he spent breaking down the subject. So we've been talking about the book uh, or the, uh, the church of Ephesus and We've, we talked about John on the island of Patmos, and we led up to the church of Ephesus, and last week was kind of our second week really breaking that down, and we're moving up the road today, and we're going to talk about the church of Smyrna, and uh, we're going to spend today, it'll be a general introduction to the city for us, and you'll get to learn a little bit of history. Uh, we'll dive more into it next week. Uh, we're we're going to read the letter that was written to this church We'll break it down just a touch, not, not really get into the weeds on it tonight. Uh, next week, we're really going to dive into uh, a few of the key players that was in the city because we, we've been talking about, if you don't understand the context of what's going on around these cities, it's very easy to take the content uh, out of context. And so you got to know what was going on there. Uh, when they was written. And so, like I said, uh, Carol says this is Moses. This is John. Uh, John is the guy we've been talking about in here. And this is just a painting of him on the island of Patmos. Uh, this is real blurry because I took this with my phone, and that's about how I take family photos. Uh, but we talked about how this was set up. This is what I want you to understand. And it was like a highway system that ran between these churches. And so this is why these churches were so important. Um, there was many cities in Asia Minor. These were the seven largest, and this is the ones that God had uh, given instruction for John to write to. And so, like I said, we've been talking about Ephesus. We talked about the magnificent of Ephesus and all that it was and the grandeur of the architecture and the amphitheaters and the libraries, and they had tons of pagan temples. It was a very pagan city, and so it was a very... Very hard place to, to uh, see the gospel go forth. We t I talked to you last week about the church when it was planted here. Uh, it was planted by three people. Does anybody remember who those three people were? Come on, somebody. Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul, right? Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul. And they show up, and I had my big ship up here last week. Remember that? And I, I told you that wasn't exactly what it would have looked like, but it would have been very similar to that. And there would have been all these ships that lined the harbor when they came in. And this, this city would have looked magnificent on the surface, but they were about to endeavor an incredibly hard assignment in a pagan culture where Christians were persecuted. That was a thing of the first century. And then we talked about these people, the Nicolaitans, right? And we talked about the danger of these people and how they had invaded all the churches, really, in Asia Minor, but there was two churches where they were predominant in. Do you remember the two churches? There was Ephesus and Pergamum. And so those was the two churches where they, they was very influential. And what did God say about these people? He, he said he hated their deeds, right, Judy? He, say, he didn't say he hates the people because God doesn't hate anyone, but he hated their deeds, he hated what they did. And uh, the deeds of the Nicolaitans were, were 
uh, they were a compromising people. They always compromised the standards of God. And so we, we, we got off into some really interesting conversation last week about how that looks in the American church, right? Like the, the compromising and, and, and that when you bend one thing, it tends to bend everything just a little bit at a time. And so we talked about that last week. And so I'm going to pause right there and I'm just going to ask you guys, uh, is there any comments or questions that you want to bring to light in our conversation so far about Ephesus or the Nicolaitans? So far, it's just been me and Pastor every week, so somebody else can speak into this. I was like, man, Pastor, I'm really glad you come and ask some questions and bring some comments, man. Aren't they the ones that claim to, to follow God, but they uh, practice idolatry and sexual immorality? Some of them did, yes. And the reason that they did what they did was because persecution was so, so hard at the time that they said, surely we can bend some of the rules. And so they would practice pagan practices. And sometimes it wasn't because they believed pagan things. It was just they didn't want the persecution of standing out and being a believer. Because you think it's hard today? It was nothing compared to what it was in this culture. And so, yeah, they would participate in things they didn't even believe in just so that they didn't get persecuted. And Jesus was like, I hate that. In fact, he says, you're for me or you're against me. So, good question. Good comment. Somebody else? Anything else so far in class? Something stand out to you? Really believed in God, but is afraid to give up the other gods. Sure, yeah, and and you you do see. How many of you know Christianity is a journey, right? Oh, yeah. Man, so if you was raised in this your whole life, and and you get saved, I mean, just imagine this: you get radically saved, but you have your family over here, you have all of your friends over here that's pulling on you. That's that's a tough, tough time to live, but the Bible says. God looks for you to make that decision. Me and my son, we were riding around this week, and we were going to Springfield for something, and he said, what would happen if you was put in a position where you had to choose between Jesus and mom? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's a good question. I was like, I'd choose Jesus, man. I was like, that's what we're called to do. But it's easy to say that right now because right. nobody's pointing anything at me, making me make a decision, right? But here's the thing. If you don't make that decision now, you will not make that decision then. You have to have that solidified in your heart. And so, yeah, I do believe that. Good, good question. Anything else? As we move on, anything? All right. Well, we're going to talk tonight then about Smyrna. And uh, Smyrna is located in what is modern-day Turkey. It is believed to be about 40 miles uh, north of Ephesus. So again, Ephesus would be down here. And Smyrna was an incredible city as well. And so here is the letter that God uh, has John speak to the church that's located here. To the angel, and we're going to pause for a second. What is, who's, the, who's he talking about there? Yeah. Right, he's talking about the pastor. And so the angels could be two things. They could be spiritual beings or they could be pastors. And, uh, that word angel means messenger in the original language. And so in this text, he's talking about to their pastor. And I told you over and over so far, if there's anything major God's going to do in the church, he's going to speak to the pastor first. That's called order. That's the way he does it. If you ask me why, I'm not God. I just know God is a God of order, and that's the way he does it. And so if there's something that's... In, that is uh, wrong with the church, can I just tell you, he speaks to the pastor first. And the reason is, is because he's the shepherd, the overseer he's placed there to bring correction to the people. And he's supposed to do that with love and grace and mercy and humility and handle her as Jesus would handle his bride because that's his bride. And so to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, amen? Just me. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> who died and came to life again. This is going to be incredibly important, okay? We're going to talk a little more about this last week. Because he's going to talk about, this is actually talking about Jesus, yeah. who died and rose again. But it's also talking about this church. Because yeah. this church was basically put to death, and it resurrected. And then it's put to death, and it resurrects. And they keep trying to kill this church, but this church has no quit in it. This church just keeps coming back. This is why this, is no, this church is known as the church of persecution or the church of suffering. Now, again, I'm going to pause right here just for a second because this is what we do as, as humans. We pray always that God would deliver us from suffering. And can I tell you, suffering sometimes is part of life. Sometimes he uses the suffering to reveal a piece of the character of who he is to you and to other people. And I'm not saying God puts you through suffering, but sometimes because we live in a fallen, broken world, things happen to us, but God is always with us. And that's what you're going to see with this church is the enemy tries to kill this church over and over and over, and it keeps coming back alive. And so it's a thorn in Satan's side. I know your afflictions, he says, and your poverty, this word poverty is a crazy word if you study this word out in the original language. Okay, so in the, in the original language, there was two types of poverty. And this isn't in your notes. Uh, there's the two types of poverty. One was what you would have, they would call slave labor poverty, okay? That means you're poor, okay? You don't have a lot of money, but pastor, back in those days, he could hire me, and as a slave, I would work for him, and he would pay me whatever he wanted. That might be minuscule wages because that's usually what it was. He would pay me minuscule wages, but I would take that because maybe that's the only job I could get. And so that's one type of poverty. And so you're poor. You're, you're literally, I mean, you're, you're like, where's my next meal going to come from poor? You're, you're, you're even underneath paycheck to paycheck poor. Does everybody get this? Yep. But then there's a whole nother level of poverty, and it's worse than that. And that's actually what he's talking about here. And this level of poverty was a level of poverty where he's addressing these Christians because they could not get a job. They had no way to make income. If, if God did not come through, they died. And the reason they didn't get a job was because the Romans absolutely hated Christians. And again, I told you in one of the classes, you go back to where this started. This started under the Emperor Nero. Uh, whenever there was a great fire that took place in the Roman Empire, and Nero's people actually did this, and it wasn't intentional. It was actually accidental. But if they were just like the government is today, they wouldn't take responsibility for their own actions. And so they blamed it on a group of people. And the group of people they blamed it on was the Christians. And they said they're trying to create anarchy and overthrow the Roman Empire. And so from that day, it was bad news for the Christians. And so they could not get a job. They had no money. They had no hope outside of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Now, here's the thing. This church, though, with this condition, had a different perspective. This church, they didn't see themselves as poor. Neither did Jesus. I want you to think about that. Everything in life is a mindset. You think you have it bad until you meet somebody that has it worse. They think they have it bad until they meet somebody worse. Everything is a mindset. He says, your poverty, yet you are rich. Perspective. And he says, uh, know about uh, your rich. I know about your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Know about your slander of those who say they are Jews and they are not. We're going to get into this in next class. But our of the synagogue of Satan. That's pretty tough. He says, do not be afraid. You should underline that in your Bible. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Pause again. If you are walking with Jesus, he gives you warnings. <laughs> 
I mean, he'll talk to you. He'll show you things. He prepares you for things. Jesus doesn't want you to be caught off guard. One of the biggest lies that people will tell you is, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. There's some truth to that. Like, you're not supposed to predict the day or the hour. But listen, he says very clearly, you will know the signs. What is that? That's a warning. That's him saying, he says even with that, don't be caught off guard. <laughs> don't be like the virgin who has no oil in your lamp. What's he saying? I'm giving you a warning. Now, if you ignore the warning, that's on you. That's not on him. He'll give you warnings of things that you go through that he knows is going to be hard for you to go through uh, that has nothing to do with necessarily what I would say is just suffering, just because of relationship. I'll sh share one that's personal. Last time I lived here, one of my very best friends in life next to my wife was my grandma. And last time I lived here, I was going back and forth to the hospital in Jacksonville when she was there. And one particular day, uh, I, I was asked to go over and visit her. And, and I went over, and I'd been over back and forth like four or five days in a row. And I was on my way to the hospital, and the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, your grandma's not going to make it through this time. And I was just like, I didn't want to hear that, because I was like, ah, I don't want to hear this. And he said, this is the message I want you to preach at her funeral. And he literally, from Pawnee to her hospital room, gave me her, the message for her funeral. And I was a mess. I'm crying, snotting. I, I get out of my truck. I go in there. It's not what I wanted to hear. I go in there. My grandma's sitting up. She's joking in bed. If you look at her, it was like everything was good. But I knew when God spoke to me, and it didn't make sense. The next morning, she passed away. I didn't even have to write the message because I already knew what I was to preach. And I was like, God, why did you share that with me? He said, because I knew what she meant to you. God will show you things. Listen, I'm not saying he shows you everything, but he'll show you things if you're in relationship with him. So he says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison and test you. That means this. Everything is not roses when you follow Jesus. These were followers of Jesus. They didn't do anything wrong. This still happened to them. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. That's pretty specific. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as a victor's crown. That's pretty powerful. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. To the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. This church was not rebuked. <laughs> this church was warned. Hard times are coming. How does this relate to us today? Hard times are coming. <laughs> we want revival without persecution. That never happens. <laughs> Anytime you see revival break out in church history, it's because the people of God were being persecuted. And they stuck together, and God shows up and lights a fire in the midst of them. And if you don't believe that, go back and study the Azusa Street Revival. Go back. So we started putting the pictures of church history here on the walls. And when we figure out how to get them to stay on there without falling down, we will have the rest of them beautifully displayed. Uh, so if you have any ideas, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> so when we was looking at this, do you know even this church had persecution when it first began? So whenever they were preaching from the railroad tracks, I've heard the story they would put tar on the railroad tracks because they didn't want a meeting out there. That's persecution, people. The enemy's not going to lay down and just give you what you want and be like, yeah, take it. You, this is why when we pray, we have to pray audibly because you have to enforce the law of God on the enemy. And Pastor Parsley would tell us this all the time when we prayed. The only thing the devil understands is somebody that's got a bigger stick. And sometimes you got to remind him you have the bigger stick. So, Smyrna. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we see this church 
that is, you know, suffering persecution, not by what they're doing wrong, but why they're doing right. What they're doing right. Okay. So, how does this line up with the American perspective of church? Because that would be consistent with many churches in other places of the world, Muslim world, and, you know, in China and other places. They, they relate more to the church in Smyrna than I think probably most American churches do. So mm-hmm. how does that line up? I mean, what, what do we do with that? Um, just a minute, let me phone a friend. <laughs> He's using a lifeline. Stop calling <laughs> <laughs> it, it lines up like this. <laughs> it lines up like this. We have a false we have a false perspective of the gospel in America. I'm just going to lay it out there. We think that the gospel is a gospel where there is no suffering. That's not biblical. It's not biblical at all. And so it doesn't mean your whole life is going to be suffering, but you will have battles. You'll have trials. Here's the thing. You have to believe God is the same God in the valley as he is on the mountaintop. He's the same God that will help you overcome the toughest season of life as he helped you overcome the easy seasons in life. And so when we look at the American church, we want all the fire. We want all of the blessings and benefits with none of the struggle. You don't even see that with the disciples. You don't see that with anyone in the gospel that followed Jesus. You don't see that in the Old Testament with the people that made a decision for God before they'd ever even seen him. They were persecuted. They were beat. They were stoned. They were left for dead. They were fed to lions. My favorite, one of my favorite areas of the Bible, and we're going to read about it tonight, is in Hebrews 11 when it tells the story. Suffering was even Jesus' life. It was who he was. And he says, if you follow me, you will drink from the cup that I drink. And the only one that was kind of naive about that was Peter. And he's like, all right, let's, let's. And he's like, you don't understand, Peter. <laughs> all right. What he was saying was the persecution I'm going to go through. If you're following me, you're going to go through that. And so this is what makes, this is what makes when God shows up, and answers your prayer in a way that you want him to answer your prayer, that much sweeter. Can I just say that? Like, you're going through a battle with cancer or sickness or disease, right? And you're like, God, I want healed here. And that happens. Man, that's why you should be that much more thankful. Because even if you die, can I tell you this? You're healed. It might not happen the way you want it to happen, but you're healed. But... Suffering is part of the gospel. And so I think, Pastor, to answer your question, because you didn't answer your phone, I think, I think part of your, to answer your question is, we have a false gospel uh, that's floated around for so long in America that doesn't line up with what they taught, what they knew. And so suffering's not all bad either. Can I tell you that? Some of the greatest growth you'll go through in life is the hardest times. I was doing a freedom weekend last weekend, two weekends ago, and uh, the Holy Spirit hit me, and I, I just began to tell the people that I was talking to, I said, do you realize, like, you're celebrating at this revelation, but this, a lot of this came from whenever I was hooked to machines in a hospital bed. That was a season of suffering. It was a season of sickness where I was... I was asking God, Lord, get me out of this. I don't want to do this anymore. And God was like, I'm going to show you something about me you you would never see if you was out there. And so he didn't put me there, but he used the situation. It says that what the enemy means for bad, the Lord will turn and use for good of those that love him. And so he'll do that for you too, if that answered your question at all. Uh, Yeah, go ahead. So what do you think is coming? Maybe Brant can answer into this. Maybe because he's, he's our professional blogger on staff. Yeah. So, so um, but also I think Theos and Judy may have some insight as well. Maybe others, you know, that have been looking into this. But I think God is speaking prophetically to this. Church. I think Nancy Pelosi. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
No, I'm kidding. Don't get offended. <laughs> Write me an email about Nancy Pelosi. Uh, no, but I do think, and I will say, I agree 100% with what Lori said in prayer today. We are in the final moments. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because when you look at prophetic signs, there's hundreds of them, but there's 36 that you really have to watch through. And we could get into a whole class on Revelation whenever it comes to the backside of Revelation another time. But there's like 36 of them that you really, you get into. And out of those 36, then there's like 12 of them that are real specific. And, 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 and it, he narrows things down to where there's some things that could have never happened in human history. They're only possible to happen now. So one of them is, it talks about there'll be uh, the false witnesses, right, that shot and they're laid in the street and the world watches this. That could have never happened in human history until the power of the capability of what we have now. I mean, even look in the rural America. I mean, even rural America was isolated. They're running carbon fiber optic lines to us now. Uh, What's going on? Let me just tell you what's, where I think we are as a nation. As a nation, I think we are on the, you need to use my word, Pastor, the cusp, the edge of the, the next big thing I think that's going to begin to take place, and they're already starting this, is pushing us towards one world government and one world religion. Yeah. And I think God is showing us, don't bend to that. I think the next things you're going to see in the world is you're going to see the economic systems around the world, because it's already happening, begin to collapse. Because that's driven by someone. Who's that driven by? It's not driven by the Democrats. It's not driven by the Republicans. It's driven by Satan. Because <laughs> it's what he wants to happen. Because he's going to push one last time to try to get control of this thing. And he doesn't care if he wins, because he knows he doesn't win. But he's out to destroy as many of us as he can along the way. This is why you have to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. You have to walk and know where you're going. You have to know when the government's trying to tell you to do things that are contrary to your belief system. This is when you have to make a decision. And we're going to be forced to do this, I believe, in our lifetime, where you are going to have to make some tough decisions. Here's, here's one right now that's going on, right? The whole transgender homosexual stuff. What happens if you have somebody in your family, just throwing this out there, that is that way, and they tell you uh, you're judgmental if you don't go participate in act, not with them necessarily, but in activities that they host mm -hmm. that condones this activity. You have to make a decision in that moment. Marry them. So if we say no, we can we, we can get in trouble for that. Well, and what it, that means, I don't know, fines, like, in In Canada, but, they can they can send you to prison for preaching on that right now of what you're saying. In Canada, they have taken your freedom of speech to where they can tell you what you can preach from your pulpit. And they're wanting to bring what you said, that's so true. They're wanting to bring that here. And so we we have to have that solidified in our hearts and our minds. We're going to stand on the side of Christ because we're there. We are these people that we're reading about. One of the things that the legislators have done is they'll create a law, but then they'll put the exclusions in there that allow churches or pastors to do things that are, you know, that are Christian. But the problem with that is at some point in time, those loopholes, which they will call them, are going to be taken away. And that's how the government is going to force intrusion into the activities of the church. And if they are your source, they will be your source. I think one of the first signs was COVID. We all, the government told us what to do. You couldn't go anyplace. You had to wear masks. And we all just went along like little sheep. 
and I can't believe how stupid we were. <laughs> Man, Lori, you are <laughs> preaching. And I will say I think it was a real thing, but I do think it was a trial run for something else. And I'll just leave that there. I do think it was a trial run for something else. The government always tries to get you looking over here if they're doing something over here. But here's the thing. We can't focus on the government. We have to focus on Jesus. Because if we're focusing on them all the time, we are not focusing on him all the time. And he's the one we need to fix our gaze on because he's going to lead us. And he's going to direct us. And he's going to guide us. He's going to guard us. He's going to show us what to do. We, we had this saying in COVID, be aware, but don't stare. Recognize what's going on on the news, but don't get so caught up in it. It's what rules your day. There's, there's more stuff, more COVID's coming. There's more things coming. How do we know this? It's not gloom and doom. It's scripture. It's because we live in a time where it says this stuff will increase. It's just like Americans, they want to hear like, we're going to be the superpower until Jesus comes. You're not. <laughs> we're going to fall eventually. Why? Because we're full of lust and idolatry and we've chosen the ways of the world and darkness over the ways of Jesus as a nation. And eventually you get judged for that. He did that with every empire and nation in history. And we're going to learn about that even tonight. Let me move on and, and, and talk real quick about this city just for a little bit. They were a port city, as you see here. And this is roughly what it would have looked like. There's a big port that where they would come in with the ships. And uh, they would have these big amphitheaters, kind of like the same as Ephesus. Uh, and this city uh, rivaled with Ephesus. Uh, as far as for wealth, they was very decorative. This city was so illustrious that there was a great man who actually, he, he would go up and hang out in Ephesus, but his home was here, and that was Alexander the Great. This was where he lived. And uh, they were known uh, for their beauty and their power, uh, and they had a very strong pool in Asia Minor. The Smyrna... Uh, they had one of the highest Christian populations uh, and still do in all of Turkey today. They're fa they were famed back then, and this is kind of what it looks like today. If you'd look there, there's over uh, 4 million people in this area today. And this is still a city today. This is the only city of these seven cities that still exist. Now, it's called something else, and we'll get into that later. But this city is still around today, and so you can see the ruins throughout the city. This city has risen and falled, fall, fell many, many times, um, but it's still there today. And so they would have these huge Colosseum-type buildings around the city because this city was known as the city of entertainment. And so they were like the New York City. They were big on theater and like shows, but their shows was like, they would bring Christians into the arena, and they would reenact some scene, and then they would release the lions to kill the Christians. Or they would release some wild animals, or they would have these Christians fight to death for the entertainment of people. Um, and so that's what they were known for. And so if you go to the city today, it looks like this. You would have your modern buildings around there with your, uh, your uh, artifacts that's still there. And these arches are particularly incredible. We're going to talk about these here in a little bit. And then over these arches, these big columns that came up, there was a big uh, roof that was across here. And there was actually a roadway on top of here. And this would have been the marketplace where everybody kind of congregated in this city. And so these, this is another picture of those arches. And there was this goddess who was known there uh, to be the main goddess that was worshipped. And she was actually a twin goddess. And her name, and this is in your notes there, was the goddess named ne Nemesis. And they believed that she embodied uh, jealousy and envy and anger. And it was believed that she would uh, punish human gluttony. <laughs> and they believed she, had, she was the goddess over luck. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is you need to know the culture that they're in. So, Lori, I think it was you that was talking. You'd have people that grew up worshiping this lady, this nemesis lady, and then they would get saved. And she's the goddess supposedly of luck, so something bad would happen to somebody, and their family would be like, ah, it's because you became a Christian and you quit worshiping her. And it was like, maybe, maybe you're right. So they, they would go back to her temple and they would begin to worship her. 
That was the spirit of Nicolaitan that was in the people, saying, well, we can still believe in God, but we can hold on to this. And God's like, no, you can't. You're, you choose a side. And so then they believed that she had a twin named Sybil uh, that was in the, 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 the city um, ruled here as well. And so Alexander the Great, it was told after this city had fell into ruins and it was ravished, it was told that uh, one night, supposedly, he was, there's a mountain in the middle of the city. He was climbing this mountain and he had a dream of these two goddesses fighting and they told him to resurrect the city. And so whenever he comes down and begins to rebuild this city, again, you need to know this because this is the history of this place. He begins to rebuild this city because of this dream that he had. The guy was kind of nuts, but the, the dream that he had, the military force was crazy here because Alexander the Great lived here. Well, when he rebuilds this, this city, he wanted to eliminate all Christians because he viewed them as a threat to the Roman Empire. And I always say this, there's really no uh, major significance to this, I don't think, but I do will say, I think it's interesting the way that he died was a mosquito bite. Yeah. This is the greatest conqueror of all time dies because of a mosquito bite with malaria. Mar Marlon. Isn't that suspiciously familiar to the lady of justice that we had last night? It's very interesting you say that. <laughs> because uh, what they believed was she was called the goddess of balance. And it was her job to determine justice over the people. And so, yeah, it's very interesting you say that. As we see stuff, you're going to see a lot of things in America that's duplicated after these churches. And so we go, well, how does this relate to us? Because we took their same idols and we brought them to our country. And we just named them something else. But it's the same concept. So, yes, very interesting. The Statue of Liberty is, is a, a goddess from ancient times. Really? I did not know that. Yeah, find that out because I'd like to know that. So this is uh, another picture, again, of what Smyrna looks like today. Like I said, over 4 million people. And throughout the city, you'll see the ruins. And they just built literally these, these structure around it. And then this actually would be the middle of the city right here where this mountain goes up. And that was called... Um, Zion, when that's how it happens. Yes, that's exactly how it happens. <laughs> that's how it happens. Look it up. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, that was not me. Yep. That's called... Uh, the Mount of Pegasus, and on this mountain, like I said, that's supposedly where Alexander the Great had his big, um, his big vision, but that's also where these temples for these two goddesses are. One was on one side, one was on another side, and so one was about balance and order, right, and the other goddess they believed was the god of, goddess of fertility and motherhood and agriculture, and so it's interesting if you go back and you look at human control and you look at governments, they know if there's certain things they control, they own you. Medicine, food, water, education. There's certain things, they actually call these the seven mountains of influence uh, today. And if they can control, they've figured out if they can control these seven things, they own you. So this is why you have to know what that stuff is. This is why you have to be able to recognize and go, wait a minute, that looks a little bit weird. Wait a minute, what you're asking me to trade you is a little bit weird in our devotion today. Uh, our devotion was never negotiate with your enemy. Why? He's always doing things in his favor. It's never favoring you. It's always about him. And so he'll give you a piece of what God wanted to give you as long as you'll give him a piece of what he had in the first place. You never negotiate with your enemy. And so this is what Smyrna meant. Sweet smelling. That's what it meant. And it meant sweat. Sweat. sweat smelling. It's supposed to say, yep. What is it supposed to be? Sweet. I, I'm from, hey, I'm from Pike County. So. You said it very okay. 
So everybody smell like this. No. <laughs> Say Smyrna. So the reason it says this, you can write sweet in your notes. Two E's. Hey, I was trying to hammer these notes out. <laughs> Literally. This is why they said that for two reasons. One, uh, myrrh was made there. So it was a city where myrrh was made. So, and odor was awful in your armpits. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, myrrh was made there. And so I'm going to pass this around, and you can smell this. This is what it would have smelled like. And uh, why was myrrh important? What happened with myrrh? Somebody give me something you read in your Bible about myrrh. Right. Uh, Carol said this earlier. Me and her was talking. It was very expensive, and it's what they brought to Jesus. They would use that for uh, uh, burial, preparation for burial. Now, the second reason that this was so significant, and it was called sweet, not sweat smelling, uh, sweet smelling. Uh, uh, the second reason that this is interesting is because this church was constantly crushed, and every time it was crushed, it would release an aroma to God of love and grace and mercy. And it would just, he would radiate every time his people was crushed. They never gave in. That's how we're supposed to be when you're crushed. And uh, so they would have things like this. This would have been under the marketplace. Christians would have been kept here. This would lead you to the arena where a lot of them was murdered and martyred. But these arches was very significant. These was called the arches of Agora. And these was, these, the reason these were so significant was, like I said, they were under the marketplace and they would bring many Christians down here and they would literally murder them uh, down here under the marketplace out of the sight of a lot of people. Now there was Christians they murdered in front of people, but this was the, they would have troughs and trenches and they, there is a, there's history that says that there was times where these would be full of human blood from the amount of people that they had killed down in these things um, that would run in the streets. And so there was a guy, uh, again, this is the arches. There was a guy right here. He looks like Glenn Lytle, but it's not Glenn Lytle. It's not Glenn. There, he said could be. This guy's name is Polycarp, and he was a very famous martyr. And we're going to talk more next week a little bit about who he was. But I'll just tell you, um, he died because he would not, uh, he would, would not uh, deny Christ or his faith. In fact, when he was asked to, he said this. Uh, and this her, church history records this. He said, 86 years I have served him, and he has done nothing wrong to me. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me now? And that was one of the, some of the last words that he said as he stood um, to be killed for Christ. And he has books of history that he wrote. Uh, he was a great historian uh, that you can read the accounts of church history. And uh, how, how old was he? So he was, he was 86 whenever he said that. And so he was killed shortly after that. Yes. He was actually very influential. We'll get more into his story next week. He was so influential whenever he came to Christ. He came to Christ as a very young man. And there was a guy who lived 40 miles away by the name of John. And his faith was so strong that he actually stirred up John. And John would meet with this guy when he was young. And... Uh, his, his faith was like iron rubbing iron, is what church history says. And so John really thought a lot of this guy because he stood the ground. He never wavered in his faith. And so we're going to get more into his story in detail next week. But I would just uh, tell you, so where he was killed, he was killed on that mountain in the middle of the city because he wouldn't deny Christ. And so they took him literally by where those temples were at. They gave him another opportunity, and they burned him at the stake. And whenever he did not die, they ran a spear through him because the fire could not kill him. And so that was how he ended up dying. And so 
you see over and over though, uh, and so this would have been where he was killed. This is the, that mountain that's going up. And where this flag is at, there's a castle over here. And this is where those temples would have been back in, in, in Paul's day. And so uh, there's a castle there now. Um, what is your bullet point that said this was the home of and this was? Alexander the Great. Okay. Yep. Alexander the Great. Sweet smelling sweat. Those Roman soldiers. So, so anyway, uh, what we see here was over and over. They tried to uh, kill this church and this city. And in 1402, there was a huge massacre. Uh, and the emphasis was on killing Christians. And this is kind of what it uh, looked like back in the original days. They was killing Christians then. And then you see all the way up till 1922, that's not very long ago, uh, there was an initiative that was sent into this area to try to eliminate all of what was called the Sumerian Christians at the time. And so uh, they could not do that. And so, but where we're talking about, when we're talking about this church, is anywhere between 100 to 320, 330 AD. So we're kind of in this realm of time. If you want to go back and look at the emperors that was that I gave you the first week that was ruling at the time, uh, that's where they would have been. And they saw unrelenting persecution. So if you have your Bible, go to Revelation 2, and we're going to look at verse 10. And all the attempts to kill this church were unsuccessful. And this church is still alive today. And I'm going to leave you with this. It says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And, put, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Our goal is not to be focused on the negative and the suffering and what we're going through. Our goal is to be focused on Jesus. And if we do that, no matter what happens to us, he rewards us in the end. Amen? All right, you guys got any questions or comments? We're going to get these people some deodorant, change their name. The Statue of Liberty was built for the goddess Libertas, who was the goddess of freedom. The goddess of freedom. Well, if you really want to get into some stuff that will really mess with your mind, just look at, so Pastor was talking about where we're at. So just look at some of the statues that we have around the world. So it talks about one of the things in in. Uh, prophecy it talks about the woman that rides on the back of the beast go and look at the statue that's outside the united nations <laughs> it's a woman riding on a beast and the title of the statue is the woman on the beast <laughs> you, you can't make this stuff up it's right there and open and they're the ones that's pushing for one world government and then if you go and you you research about the uh the different animals that they saw in the vision of Ezekiel. He talks about, or Daniel, I'm sorry, Daniel. He talks about the beast with the ten horns and out of them comes different things. He always uses symbols. Symbols are huge in prophecy. And, and I won't get real deep into this, but I'll just say it talks about four specific symbols there. And so these are four things you really got to watch for when you know things are winding down. It talks about a lion. And so you know that what country is symboled by a lion? Usually Britain. And you look at that, and it's on their crest. There's lions. It talks about a bear, which would be Russia. That's pretty obvious, right? It talks about a leopard. And if you go and you look at crest over thousands and thousands of years of history, that would be Germany. And then it talks about an eagle that comes out of, this is how specific it is, comes out of, the, the lion, where did we come from? Right. And then it says this, the eagle loses his wings and stands up in the form of a man. 
And so we're the, one of the only nations, we have two symbols that we're known for around the world, an eagle and Uncle Sam. And so this stuff is right in your Bible. And he says, hey, this eagle that loses its wings and stands up in the form of a man will fall to this, this bear and the red dragon. The red dragon is often represented as China. China. <laughs> and it says, when you see the Euphrates River drying up, they're getting ready to march. And right now, the Euphrates River is dry. <laughs> It's the only time in history it's ever happened, people. We got to pay attention to some of that. And so, again, it's why you don't focus on what's coming as much as you focus on who's in control of your life. Because no matter what you go through, you win in the end. Just like these people, they were crushed and crushed and crushed and crushed, and they would release an aroma, which God said, this was the only church that you're going to find that he doesn't rebuke. He's like, just like, man, my heart goes out to you people because I know what you're going through. He knows where you're at tonight, church. So let's pray. God, we thank you. You are a God of order. You are a God of direction. You are a God of wisdom. You are a God of warning. Yes. Let us pay attention to the details that you tell us. Let us write them down and meditate on them. Let us study your word that we would know your word, that it gets inside of us, that we would not be swayed or distracted by the things of this world. We would not be attracted to the offerings of the enemy, those offerings of protection and food and safety. But Lord, we would have you be our source. We would follow you. And just as this church was crushed over and over and over and over. But yet they remained faithful to you. Yes. Let that be said of our lives, that we would, no matter what we go through in life, we would always remain faithful to you. That the aroma of our lives would be sweet smelling in your nostrils, God. Yes. Let us represent you well and continue to guide us, guard us, and show us the, your ways, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yep. Third. Today it is the third largest city in Turkey. I'm like you, Jane, and I have to have my blanks filled in. <laughs> huh? Oh, the, the name of the city is Izmar. I Z M I R. That's what that's what this city is called today. Izmar. It is known as the ornament of Asia. The ornament of Asia? Yep. The ornament? Like a Christmas ornament? Oh, that's Nemesis. Yes, correct. Yep. Yes, Sebel. It's C E B L E, but that's Nemesis. Yep. Yeah, next week when we talk about his life, wait till you hear some of the stuff this guy did. He was amazing. He was amazing. And he was that. He lived up to his name. Names are powerful. Dennis, what were you going to say? Well, I just was saying several weeks ago, a couple of months ago, Marsh and I read this book, and it was a former police officer that had no real... You guys are dismissed if you want to leave. ...had no real call to study Christianity, but he wanted to prove the reality or not reality of who Jesus was. He went back and he did tons of research using the, a police officer's techniques of trying to put together a case. And he showed the, that road that connected the seven churches. He used history to show that that couldn't have happened until that moment in time because of they, ne they didn't have any system to connect those churches until that specific moment. That's crazy. So, you know, the, the routes that, you know, the event that the 
the disciples took and the evangelists took could not have happened had it not been at that exact moment in time. Wow. And, you know, the, the census of state, yeah. that had to be at that specific moment in time. And that's nothing that, like, Joseph or them, like, that's nothing they would have had control over because that's government. Yeah. 